Namaskar. Welcome to DGI 374. And my co-host Sridhar Chityala joins me today. And we are going to do a big reveal as to what we think China's plans are going to be. And there is going to be a lot of data that's going to be shared your way so that you understand why we are saying what we are saying. Is it India? Is it Taiwan? Or is it something else? And this is what we are going to be looking at today. Let's welcome our co-host Sridhar Chityala ji. Sridhar ji, namaskar and welcome to Guru's channel. Namaskar. Good morning to everybody or uh, early good evening to uh, those in India. Looking forward to the show, sir. Um, Sridhar ji, now we know she's seven yes men are in place. Also, if you look at their ages, you also know who he has handpicked as his possible successor. There's only one person who is in his late 50s or early 60s. So there's no brainer there as to who he thinks should, should succeed him. But there have been a lot of planning that has been going on in the back about what Xi Jinping wants to do. Perhaps this was the reason why the entire lot through, uh, you know, went his way and not Hu Jintao's way. We will never know that part, of course. But I'm going to yield the floor to you now, sir. And you can start taking it away and give us your prediction as to who Xi Jinping is going to attack and why. Namaskar and uh, thank you so much for the context and I think uh, Sriji uh, quite uh, appropriately uh, you know said said it by saying uh, you know we have been talking about the whole construct of their political bureau and the great the grand uh, CCP Congress um, and uh, and so you can we will share via the slides uh, how this has kind of developed not just uh, in the present context but over a period of the tenure uh, of Xi Jinping thus far. I also would like to thank members of my uh, research team, you know, who have done, uh, you know, who are also energy specialists um, and uh, they've done the work in terms of providing us the, the data. So coming to the first slide here, what we are saying here is we have shared this before. Now, all seven members of the Politburo Standing Committee are Xi Jinping's men. I think between 18 to 20 members of the Politburo are also the Xi Jinping's men. Most of the Central Committee members of 37, 376 Central Committee members are effectively his men who in turn select the, the Politburo and the Standing Committee. In, in other words, it's all Xi Jinping and it's all his yes men. And during this particular phase, a uh, lot of purging has happened and she wants to uh, interject. Yes, uh, just one small correction, Sridharji, that is 24, not 25. He kicked out the one person who was supposed to be uh, considered to be a Hu Jintao supporter in the Politburo. And yes, uh, there's been a lot of work that has been done by the research team and our heartfelt thanks to them. Please take it away, sir. No, it's great. I think that, as I said, they've been very careful whether it's 24 or 25, but the Politburo comprises as, is 25. 18 men, I'm told, is Xi Jinping's men. Uh, as uh, she pointed out, one person has been kicked out. Anyway, going down up to the Congress, all orchestrated, all Xi Jinping's yes men. So it's not about competency. It is about who has got loyalty to the emperor. That seems to be... <laughs> uh, who is the emperor? The emperor is Xi Jinping. So the next slide uh, just lays down. We have discussed the seven names. Uh, Zhao Liji, Kai Ki, uh, Li Jing. Uh, Ding Jiang, uh, Bang Huning, and Li Qiang. These are the members of uh, uh, the, the core members. They all lined up for the photograph after the, uh, the Congress, and they could be seen uh, saying, uh, yes, yes, yes. And many of them from Shanghai and Beijing, and uh, history says that they all go back to the time when he has worked uh, with, with Xi during, the, during that particular phase. Now, coming to the next slide, which is very important, uh, this is the Central Military Commission. In uh, the Jiang Jemin's time, you know, they had a dual distributed type of a power in terms of the, the construct of the, uh, uh, the two committees which make up the, uh, the, uh, the military commission, the operational command and the administrative control. He has brought all of them, purged zillions of people and brought um, the army as well under his command and so that all these generals will now say, we are ready, you give us the order, we are ready to march. That's the people. So he wanted to make sure before he does anything, either in Taiwan. So he, he in his speech, identified three specific objectives for achieving Greater China. One, reunification of Taiwan. 
Second is the conquest of Senkaku. Well, he made Senkaku very specific uh, in his address. And third is occupying those islands which are under dispute in South China Sea. These are the three things that he specifically mentioned. He said that what, we, what he calls as the global south, which comprises of parts of Asia, parts of Africa, and parts of um, Central Asia, he said we have partnerships in place in the broader global south, but these three things for greater China, we must reunify with, with China. So with that objective in mind, so we now roll forward. So first of this is that we will touch on in the next slide, is Senkaku. So we have touched, remember, Sriji, we did an extensive piece of work last year on Senkaku. Yes, uh, we did. We have why it is important and why both for Japan and, uh, and, and, and China, the Senkaku. Senkaku today is, uh, is claimed by Japan, but contested by Shanghai, okay, uh, China, Beijing. Why it is contested? It is contested, we'll come to in a minute. But you can see from a strategic location point of view, it is very proximus to Taiwan, and it is not that too far from Japan. There's a whole bunch of islands that you can see. They all broadly constitute uh, the part of the Senkaku Islands. Why it is important? It is important from a strategic location point of view. I call as three pivots. The three pivots are, one, it is a strategic point of deterrence, uh, either from offense or defense point of view. Those who sit, those who sit here, that's the first point. And second, it is home to largest gas and shale reserves. Okay, it is silently that data point has been kept in a subtle manner without bringing about the importance of this specific issue. Go back to, again, June, July, uh, probably July edition of Daily Global Insights. We have again covered as to how China and Russia conducted joint exercises with ships navigating around the Senkaku Islands. Okay. Now, the statement from Xi Jinping confirms what his strategic objective rather than just merely contesting the Senkaku. Next slide. Yes. <clears throat> so now you can, we have now delineated this area where the natural gas explore, exploration as well as the, the shale gas is taking place. In 19, somewhere around 1969, 67, United Nations identified this spot without deep exploration that this is a point of both natural gas as well as shale reserves. If you see this map, it very much looks like what is happening in line of LAC, line of actual control. You have Japanese staking a claim around the Senkaku, which the Chinese and the Taiwanese call it as Diao Islands. So you have the Chinese map, which goes well past the Senkaku into the, so you have the, you have the outer red zone, you have the green zone. Green zone is the Japanese claim, the red zone is the Chinese claim. Taiwanese used to claim this area to say that it is part of theirs because they got also access to the reserves. And when you look at it from a proximity point of view, it is very close to Taiwan. Now, right now, as we speak, there's somewhere between 150 to 200 million barrels of oil per day is the estimate. This is on the shale side. On the natural gas side, it is somewhere 155 billion cubic uh, feet, feet. feet yeah. of the gas. So it's an enormous, but to give credit to the Chinese, they have been the first guys drilling this area going back in time. So they built the first drilling platforms. You can see where their drilling platforms are located, marked red. And then there is a small area which is called a joint development. Predominantly, uh, the Japanese came in. Now, this is called as the, the, the joint development area is called as the Okinawa Basin, which is the Okinawa Islands are just south of the Japan in the map. Okay. So the south, and this is the extension of the Okinawa Basin where there has been this natural reserves established. So naturally, 
For China, this is strategic of strategic importance. Japan, which lacks, which requires the same resources, is actually contesting and woken up having started late. We believe this is his lower hanging fruit and jointly with Russia, we'll come to that in a second, that this could be the first one that China would take and there may not be much contest for this particular area, notwithstanding its rich potential as an energy security for the Pacific. Okay, why? Basically, because they, they will put all the resources. If you look at the map in the Korean Peninsula, already the Korean theater is very active. They will also put up resistance on Taiwan, but they may just give it away in the larger kind of a context. So we believe that this may be the first one that China will attempt to take over because then this gives them what you call as the blockade. They can do a Taiwanese blockade, they can do a Japanese blockade, and they can control the East China Sea access from these islands where they don't have a armed footprint. So this is this is the uh, this is this rationale that we are trying to present. Now going to the next slide. So here's the historical context. When you go and when you look at the historical context from 1895 onwards. Japanese occupied these oil islands through a conquest. Post-World War II, United States handed over these islands to Japan with China contesting it. And then from 1971, China and Taiwan both have been claiming stake for these specific islands. Basically, because if you, if you recall, when the revolution happened, the Taiwanese, um, the general, uh, moved into uh, what you call as the ROC, Republic of China, the Chinese, they, they state claim, they defeated the PLA and the PLA went back into mainland. So this is the historical context and why this is being contested. The map on the top shows you whole swag of islands which constitute what you call Diao or Senkaku. So this is the strategic kind of, we believe, the strategic context since it is in the official statement that this could be the first one of the rank for Xi Jinping. Um, Sridharji, before we go to the next slide, I have a couple of questions, sir, because my questions are uh, adding up and I'll forget afterwards. First question, sir, is Senkaku has been downplayed by the United States. This is the first time, like we are taking a, you know, a zoom lens and looking and showing it. But the United States hasn't really played this thing up thus far. They have not expressed any concerns. I think all they are doing is, you know, routine patrolling of the uh, Taiwan Sea, the, what, the sea that separates uh, mainland from uh, Taiwan. They have been patrolling that. But what do you think is the United States thinking about the possible occupation of Senkaku by China? Because this is a low-hanging fruit, like you said. Well, I think China is uh, distracted by... Uh, sorry, United States is distracted by two things. Right now, as we speak, uh, there is a major exercise, patrolling exercise, joint exercise going on between South Korea and United States to thwart off the North Korean nuclear attempts and nuclear exploration. Plus, he's got a lot of toys. He keeps firing those toys into the Korean Peninsula. So therefore, this is Kim Jong. He keeps firing those toys. So they have been completely preoccupied and distracted uh, in the effort in the Korean Peninsula. That's number one. Number two, they've also been distracted with this mindless Ukraine war that is going on. Right now, they're going to send another $750 million worth of equipment into Ukraine. And the third, they are busy focused on Indo-Pacific economic framework. They've forgotten Quad. Once upon a time, Quad used to do regular patrolling. Again, you look at 2021, second half coverage of the Daily Global Insights. We had Oscus. We had Quad. We had the um, Her Majesty's, uh, uh, I think, you know, whether it is Hercules or Elizabeth, one of those big vessels making a cruise into the uh, into the into the into this part of the world then you had uh, the french uh, send their troops uh, send, send their 
uh, frigates and uh, their uh, their vessels into this part of the world. Then you had the Germans fly these planes. It's almost like you know I want to be part of this world, but guess what? I don't have an integrated strategy to address this issue. Now, I can't answer the question why uh, why they have behaved in this illogical manner. Now, I can tell you this much being part of a, a work that we did in somewhere in 2019. There was a what we call um, an ex general, US Army, uh, uh, US Navy, built a two pronged strategy as to how to distract China in Kashmir and in uh, South China, South, uh, in South China Sea. Now, that playbook seems to have been hijacked by the Chinese. So China and Russia are now going to have a multi-pronged distracted strategy to combat US because they're going to be distracted in Korean Peninsula with a North Korean guy. They're going to be distracted in, in we'll come to the next part. In yes, indeed. Chinese. Yeah. Then they're going to be distracted in the South China Sea, let alone their problems that they are facing in Indian Ocean and then in Ukraine. So you can see that this is a very, very carefully orchestrated strategy about trade and energy security and in the process, occupation. Sir, um, we request to all our viewers to please like this video. This needs to have five times more the viewership than what we are seeing now. It is good, but it should be much, much more because of the significance of the data that being that is being revealed here. So. We have just showed you China's game plan. There, there is more coming your way. Take it away, sir. Yes. Thank you. So we now go to the north of Japan. Okay. North of Japan is the Kuril Islands. Okay. Uh, marked in red. Okay. It's administered by Russia, but claimed by Japan. Again, we have covered this in isolated manner in uh, Daily Global Insights late last year as to how Russia has moved. And in fact, Vladimir Putin visited this area. His prime minister visited this area. Once upon a time, access into this area used to be through permits. Now there's nothing. They have free movement. So they're almost encroaching into Japan right now. Um, this is fully claimed by Russia, not too far uh, from the uh, the Shakalin Islands uh, in Russia is not too far from Vladivostok, which is just bordering uh, China and Russia. So this, once it is taken, now I don't need to explain to you, you can conclude, it's not just Senkaku. If they take Senkaku, they can squeeze both Japan as well as Taiwan. So the game that is at play is Japan and Taiwan. Okay, so therefore, this area Russia is not going to give up. They've taken it. Now, again, you go back to 2008 to 2016 time period. When these islands became first point of dispute and contention and a no-fly zone was imposed, both by the Chinese and by the Russians, Mr. Obama said, who was the then president, said, please don't, commercial planes do not, uh, disobey the order, follow the navigation pattern so that the passengers are not, or the, the people are not inconvenienced. So you have had this issue simmering, but it has now come to the front end post that Trump period. There was a lull between 2016 to 2020. Now everything has opened up. And this is again a strategic fulcrum as far as Russia is concerned. And when you take a look at it very closely, when we put up the full map, you can see yes. why this whole area uh, is of, uh, you know, strategic, no gas reserves, nothing, but it is just a strategic fulcrum point for the Russians. So it's like a pincer, sir. It's like a pincer. One side is Russia, the other side is China. So exactly. basically, basically Japan is boxed in the way I see it. Exactly, Shiji. Exactly. So did Japan wake up? So now, who was the leader who identified these issues and who said we need, we need to bring to bear a security architecture, number one. We need to bring to bear an open and free maritime gateways. These are the two important things. Who was he? Mr. Shinzo Abe. Shinzo Abe. So, so now that he is conveniently out of the picture, 
Japan's leadership needs to discover its new Shinzo Abe. Uh, I mean, I cannot say enough good things about this man. He was the one who was the father of the quad concept. He was tireless, despite his health issues, to try and explain to various you know, country heads the importance of this agreement and now see what has happened. I mean, still, the Japanese government hasn't revealed how or who was behind the assassination attempt. Of course, they have caught the person who, you know, later, who shot him. But there is much more than that that is going on. I mean, this is a very, very planned step-by-step uh, -step conspiracy that has been enacted by China. I mean, I'm just taking that according to me. Okay, I won't say that. I don't have proof to say that. But according to me, it is China which has done all this thing. But you also, sir, you you probably didn't touch upon South Korea. South Korea also has the same problem. Shinkaku on the bottom, North Korea on top. Again, you have the same kind of a boxed-in problem. So they have these huge economies, and they both are going to be really, really squeezed if this starts playing out. And, sir, I'll give you the floor back, and you can look at the next slide, sir. Yeah, thank you, Shiji. So now you can see the holistic picture of Russia, China, up above the Sea of Oakstock is the uh, the Korean Peninsula. We'll see, show you in the next slide. You can see how Japan and um, and um, Senkaku is boxed in to the west of Japan. And then when you bring this map up, you can see Taiwan, Okinawa Basin, Japan, and South Korea. What is this dotted line? These dotted lines are called as the first island chains that China has disputed will claim. So this is the policy announcement that was made at the CCP Congress by Mr. Xi Jinping. We will reunify Taiwan. We will stake claim in the Indo-Pacific to the islands that rightly belong to us. And we will take Senkaku. This is not negotiable. This is his explicit statement. For that, he needed to have a political system that doesn't question him. He needed to have a PLA and an administration within the army command, both administrative as well as the control, that says yes and march to his orders to achieve this mission. So this is his goal. In the process, they will control what we set out as the three important parameters energy security, maritime gateways, and then finally, the point of deterrence. Philippines, we have again covered the Sprotly Islands, how silently they built a whole base and basin of defense capabilities with all kinds of machinery. Again, we covered this in the DGI late last year. And that happened under the watch of uh, President Barack Obama. Guys, you know, this man is being looked like the next best thing after apple pie. But if you look at his accomplishments and you have to look, you know, deep, I mean, a lot of mediocrity there. He always believed in U.S. leading from behind. I don't know what that behind means, but, you know, it, it stands, uh, you know, people have to really question what the heck did he do for eight years? And, and Mr. Biden was his trusted deputy. And look at today. Biden is not opening his mouth about his son's uh, uh, corruption charges uh, of having taken money from China. So the, the, the U.S. has a problem, in my opinion, Sridharji. It has deep infiltration by China. You saw one congressman kick one of his aides out. But this is like a drop in the bucket. Well, one I of the... <laughs> go, go ahead, sir. No, no, sorry. Yeah, at least keep going. No, one of the congressmen, Eric Swalwell, has been caught with his darn pants down with a Chinese spy. And this person is now in, in one of the biggest committees. Nancy Pelosi has appointed him. Nobody wants to question this. How this is it? How is it even possible? The same girl was caught in with the three different mayors in the Middle East. No action so far, sir. And the girl has disappeared. I mean, uh, gee, Sriji. The, um, the defense response and the defense deterrence strategy of United States. Again, guys, go back to 2020. Three major carriers from United States, Reagan, um, Reagan um, Roosevelt, 
and there was also a uh, the third one i forget the name of the third one the three were sent by president trump when china was raising its ugly voice in south china sea causing threat to those nations especially the philippines the indonesia thailand and we also covered extensively how they were draining um, the the thai river basin so therefore uh, right from myanmar so the story here is that once those three cruisers uh, three ships were uh, stationed then things went quiet now things are back in action there was initial kind of flurry in 2021 but it's now very quiet in terms of now they're focused on the korean peninsula in the meanwhile i think they're going to lose the game here as much as they're losing the game in uh, russia ukraine uh, situation which i in, in my view good money for a bad cause and i think you're going to see democrats themselves telling biden enough is enough let russia and ukraine sort out and let's get out and focus on something which is far more strategic so i think this is a very important strategic move that is happening so russia and china and russia equally is not just contended with their own gas reserves and connectivity into europe but this is this is going to be bigger because we have again covered this stuff in terms of what the almost close to 70% of the global maritime trade flows to the south china sea absolutely absolutely and uh, this is where things stand today as developments come about we will keep you posted but the more concerning thing is what happened to quad the quad could have been an effective deterrent she would not have made some of the statements he did in his address if the quad was robust if it was making its presence felt that's how i see it sridhar ji if you want to add to that and then we can call it a wrap sir no i think i completely completely endorse your sentiment i think sridhar ji that i know you had uh, you were really kind of behind my back that uh, we got to get this uh, this particular piece of work done and uh, presented to uh, to the p gurus uh, audiences so thank you so much and i think uh, i hope people can take away the data but go back to look at all of our programs around the um, the indo pacific south china sea uh, and as well as the one that we have presented today and i believe that there is a much bigger play and i think the 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 fierce intensity of china and there's so much of a focused commitment is very grossly uh, underestimated yes sir and thanks once again viewers for watching this program please like share and subscribe to our channel don't forget to click on the bell button and especially a special thanks to the research team who put together the data for this and viewers we would like you to consider donating to our cause this came about after weeks of research we wanted to be absolutely 100% sure that whatever we are presenting here is accurate and we believe we have done so so consider donating to us sridhar ji as always a pleasure having you on our channel sir and we'll be again back tomorrow bright and early i apologize we didn't do it on saturday because there were a few uh, i's to be dotted and t's to be crossed we made sure of that over the weekend and we had this today thank you very much sir namaskar thank you thank you so much sri ji and have a wonderful day and also i would like to thank sachin uh, for all the great work that he is doing for us sir. thank you